go. Um, Friday before a big weekend, keep in mind, as a general, I think uh, all drawings, unless we've got different arrangements, are due Tuesday morning for drafting 132. So get those in if you would. I think uh, the people still have a test to work on. And we want to make sure we get that taken care of. Um, also, I'm not going to go over the test, the final test, until Becca has a chance to take her version of it. So we'll just hold on to those until that happens. We're getting ready to go into a pretty detailed study on geometry called orthographic projection, or how we take objects and we display them for construction. That, that's really what we're getting ready to go through. We've got our base set of tools. We know what line weights are. Uh, we know how to set up CAD. We know how to get a print. We know how to use our tools to draw and show basic geometry. Once you have those, then, then we want to start applying them in a fashion that people can construct items off of it. Because that's really what our job is, is to communicate the design concept, right? And we need stuff built. That's where support people. That's what we need to do. We're going to spend a lot of time, a month, looking at all the different ways we take an object and display them for this purpose. And it's for that purpose only. We aren't really trying to be fancy with stuff. A short story is always a better story. Um, so we want to give them the information they need. Now, it, like I mentioned yesterday, this is going to be kind of tough for some of you because it's tough for your mind to go 3D, 2D, 2D, 3D, back and forth. It really is. And, and how do you make that connection in your mind's eye? I found the stuff out of Chapter 5 to be very useful in helping people break through that border. Uh, I used to not even cover this chapter, but I think it's paid dividends once we started because there's some really nice techniques in here for this process. And, and so let's kind of talk about a little bit about those. Um, when we talk about visualizing, the author in chapter five, and I, I know I didn't ask you to look over this, but he spends the first couple of pages, like visualization abilities, visualization cycle, talks about how our brain interacts with our optics into how different items visualize. That's all good stuff. If you get a chance to read through that and understand how your body works and why you're seeing stuff the way you are, it also helps the process. Do you have to visualize to be a drafter? No, you don't. We're going to teach you techniques and we're going to go over set rules you can draw anything on this planet and have no idea of what it looks like and still get it drawn correctly. Now, I'd be a liar to you if I told you that it didn't matter because how long do you think you're going to be happy at a job if you're doing something and you have no concept of what you're doing? So visualization is a technique that you need to really kind of excel or stay in the program right? or in the career, I guess would be a better term. Now, like I mentioned, this is going to be a slow process. Don't let it frustrate you. Okay? Stay calm and think, okay, this will come, this will come, and it will come. Now, when we go through this, some of the techniques the author talks about that are really, really useful. Um, let's look at figure 5.5 five on page 139. This guy right here. There's something about the hand-eye connection that helps you visualize. How many of you are sketchers? Like to draw or just doodle, maybe? maybe about half of you? Try and pick up this when you get ready to do an object. I have to slow myself down because I try and skip this step. My mind does. I know I need to go here and do this. And I start sketching. And once I start sketching, whether I'm sketching orthographic or isometric, things start getting right in my head. It, it's a good technique. Even if you just took two, three minutes, and it looks like a bunch of chicken scratches the first time you do it because you don't do it a whole lot. Stay with it. This is a great technique to help you visualize. You're sitting there drawing something, no idea what it is. I take a minute and I try and sketch. None of us know what everything is, and in fact, in drafting, especially if you folks go into the machine industry, you might be inventing stuff. There is no way to visualize what it is. Unless you have a vast experience and you're taking apart from here, apart from here, and putting them together in your mind. And that, that takes a lot of experience to do. This is a great technique. If you don't sketch, 
Do it. Try it. Another one, and maybe my favorite way. Let's go out of this chapter. Let's go to 536. Page 536. If you look around this section right here on 536, what they're talking about is modeling clay. Cheap. Hey, we've got a bunch of it in here. I think you can go to Walmart and buy a whole tube that would last you several years for a dollar. But you can then cut out, make a piece. You can hold it in your hand. You can move it to a two-dimensional view. You can move it to a three-dimensional view. This is far and away the most useful visualization technique for me. I, I make a lot of these to this day. I've been making them for 30 years and I still do it. Um, no, I'm not still in kindergarten, maybe mentally I am. But I do it for this specific purpose. But I got a little pocket knife I keep in my desk drawer, and yeah, I use that to do this. This is a great technique. If you are looking at one of these and you have no idea what you're looking at, you make this and all of a sudden you turn it, oh, that's where all that comes from, that's where this comes from. This is extremely useful. Um, the other thing the author's already talked about, and I'm not going to go to these pages, but isometric sketching, right? Chapter 7. That's very useful. That's also got more information in Chapter 11 if you wanted to look there. Now, when you sketch, the other thing we've got to do is we've got to kind of have some terminology. So let me introduce some terminology. Go to figure 5, 7. So we're back to Chapter 5. about. So this kind of shows some things. One, when, let's, what's a face shown right here? A face? A flat side. What's that? The, the front view. Yeah. What, if you had to define this, what would you define this face as? A surface. Okay. Uh, a defined surface, right? Okay. You will see a lot of faces. This is typically internal to a plane. Right? They'll be bounded by lines. Okay, that's when we, we're talking about a face. We're talking about the surface. Um, an edge? Anybody think of a definition of an edge? Where two planes meet? Yeah. Wherever two planes meet, you will always have an edge, and there will be a line there describing that intersection. Okay. So that whenever you see a line on a two-dimensional two view, you know that plane changes direction in some form or fashion. You have two planes meeting. Okay. A vertice. What would be a definition of a vertice? Three or more. So whenever you see a point, you know you have three or more planes that are intersecting at that point. Point being on these definitions, when you're going to see a lot of points, you're going to see a lot of lines, you're going to immediately know plane change. Planes are changing there. That will help you visualize knowing, hey, I got something else happening. You got to trace it down. When we get cylinders, just so you know, we do have lines that define the extents of cylinders. We call that a limiting element. It's where the curve leaves your line of sight. Okay, typically, where we put a quadrant point. So we will describe where cylinders, both negative and positive, negative being a hole, positive being something that's got mass, we will describe all of those with a limiting element, so the edges. Any questions on those? So the limiting element is where the plane leaves your sight. Yes. And the curved surface leaves your line of sight. Yeah. So if you think of a pencil, you know, mm -hmm. but how do I know how this is, just top and the bottom? Because uh -huh. that's both places it does. Um, what's another name for a vertice? I used it. Corner. Point. Corner. Point, what would AutoCAD chip call this? 
A node? Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, all those words are kind of synonymous, right, in our terminology. Let's go to page 141 and look at figure 511. We're going to talk a little bit now about how these 2D drawings are done. Because if you're going to try and read a two-dimensional working drawing, it's nice to know the theory behind it. And this is kind of an introduction. So I'm going to go fairly fast on it, just hit some definitions so you understand the process. We will go into the schematics of that in the days in the future. But when we draw a two-dimensional view, like this object here, in essence what we do, and this is the mathematical theory, it's imaginary. What we are going to do is we are going to put a plate of glass in between us and the object. And then our eyes, as we look through this plate of glass, etches the shape of the object we see. In, in essence, I think I got, I kind of imagined I got little laser beams on some, I don't know, robot or something. And as I'm looking at that, my laser beam comes in and etches all of these plane changes on that plate of glass that sits between me and the object. That's really what this is talking about. So whenever you look at that or see this, we're going to be looking at it and say, okay, that is the shape of all the geometry I see there from a reader sitting out here. So we've got this imaginary plate of glass we call a projection plane between us and the object. We then project the object to that plane. Um, I never really liked, well, we better go there. Let's go chapter 10. I never wrote this figure down, but let me explain this in just a touch more detail. Let me give you the page here. It's page 492. This is a figure, in fact, I think this was one of your questions for review, was this figure. Keep in mind, if you're an artist, maybe making signs or doing magazines, any of that stuff, you're probably working in this type of arena right here. You're doing a drawing process that's math-based. We call it perspective projection. When you're in the drafting fields, when we're doing things we have to kind of build, we need to show in a different format, not in an eye-pleasing way. We have to show them true size and shape. We use down here parallel projection. Both of them have a plate of glass in between. They have very different results. This one, the object will be as the eye sees it because of this angle going on right here. It will never be true size and shape. We have no idea what the sizes are because it's got to be eye-pleasing. Many times it's a three-dimensional view. Hey, do we do these types of drawings? Yes, we do. You've got a class and it's the first one when you come back in the spring semester that we do perspective drawings on. So you're going to learn these techniques. But for the most part, they are for people out of the construction trades. You know, financiers, they still need to know what we're doing. They're giving us money to do it. Bankers, not all of them can read technical drawings. Therefore, those people involved in the project that aren't doing the building. What's the difference between these two? There's one difference. Anybody know what the difference is? Yeah, yeah Sean? So, on the, the bottom one, the parallel one, the shape doesn't get any bigger. It stays the same size. It's just, it just shows that depth. Mm -hmm. And then on the perspective one, it's taking it from like a shrunken down piece on a piece of paper to like what it would actually look like, like actual size almost. Yeah, I mean that's kind of it in a nutshell. You, you still never said the reason why, but you know you're seeing the result of the reason. Where these are coming off perpendicular to my plane of projection, my plane of glass, this is true size and shape. Because my little laser beams right here they're all at 90 degrees. These aren't. Now, why are these at 90 and these aren't, though? Why? Wait, can you see that again? 
why do these projection rays and this projection theory come in where this angle right here, if I hit it, that's 90 degrees. Okay. These is, this is not. Okay. We don't know what that angle is. It just depends on where that person's sitting where that plate of glass is. Oh, I think I just gave it away. What's the difference between the two? Where a person sitting? Yeah, where's the person sitting at the top? We define the location of it. Where's the person sitting on the bottom of it? It says right below it. Infinity viewpoint. Is that infinity? So what that is, picture this. So this person is standing, we define this location, we define this, we define what the object is. This creates a very eye pleasing view. What if we take this and we move it back to say here? Let's see if I can draw there a little person. Mine has a smiley face. Now if I do it from here and I draw this in, what happens to this angle? It kind of shoots. It gets smaller and smaller, right? Or actually, yeah, because this is a pretty big angle from here. So it's going to get smaller. If I get back further, get back here, these lines are almost going to start being parallel, right? If I take this person and put them at infinity, these lines do become parallel. That's the big difference between these theories. Once you understand that mathematically and you turn that into an application, you can draw anything. Okay, but that's the mathematical theory that sits behind a two-dimensional view. We do this. We're always at infinity. That plate of glass is sitting between us and the object. Therefore, all of our projection rates are perpendicular to my plate of projection. When we do these, I define it all. We'll get into these later. They're kind of fun, especially for technical people like us that live our life here. It's fun to step out and do one of these every now and then. But that's, in essence, how a two-dimensional view is created, the mathematical theory behind it. Okay. Now, when you create these views, and so what we're talking about here, you, know, you can kind of see the projection, but let's just jump to the glass box and just kind of view that. Let's go to page 499. So when we do this orthographic projection mystery, in essence, all we're doing is we take any object, we encase it in a glass imaginary box. I don't care what the object is. It could be a haul truck in my mining industry that wouldn't fit in this room. I, it's an imaginary glass box. I can make it as big as I want. If you're drawing this building, we put a glass box around this building. Then we get an infinity and we project to it. Now, we, if we got this box has six sides. So then we unfold the box to put it on a piece of paper and these are the views that result. So here's our six views. We've already talked about these a little bit. Hence, every one of those was done using parallel projection. When we unfold the box, we call it multi-view projection. So that's, in essence, the process. When you get this right here, we've got all these lines and edges and vertices and faces and limiting elements that we have described. We use that terminology or knowledge of the terminology to identify what these individual shapes are. Now, there's only three types of planes you're going to hit here. You know all these spaces? So all these white spaces that are sitting in here on these views, those are all faces, or what we call planes. In essence, really, they're surfaces, right? A defined face. Um, you're only going to hit three types. And, and let's look at those three types. And these are back in Chapter 5. Um, let me see. I want to go to page 145. One, four, five. Okay, so here they're starting, they're showing you, this is their intro into the glass box, how we project into these types of planes. Now, the three planes you will hit 
Okay, the first one is shown right here below it in figure 518, and it's called a normal plane. Okay, a normal plane. You see how it projects right there if you, uh, yeah, we'll just say on this figure. Now, when I say a normal plane, what does normal mean? It's an engineering term that means perpendicular. Okay, normal, whenever you see that, you're seeing perpendicular. Okay, so what that's saying on a normal plane is that my line of sight, remember, they're all parallel. I'm looking right into that face at 90 degrees. Okay. Whenever I have a normal plane, I see a true size and shape. This is the majority of your planes. Like if I'm drawing this guy, and you guys can put your plate of glass in between me and there. We've got edges that are showing up in here. This one's normal, that's normal, that's normal. On that view, in fact, everything that you will describe is normal. Because the plane always sits at 90 degrees to you. So it's true size and shape. Now, think of this plane right here. If I turn this for a multi-view, which is always 90 degrees, how does this plane always have to appear? Turn it to here, that kind of just hanging around. How do I now see that plane? You see it as a line, right? Normal plane always is true size and shape. How do you know? Go to any other view and it's got to be a line. That's how you tell it's a normal plane. So when I look at a 3D drawing, like look, look at the one on the top, or a multi-view drawing, excuse me. Okay. Do we know if this is a normal plane? You see a shape here. You know there's a face. How do you know? Go to the top view. There's that plane right there, right? Mm -hmm. It's a line. Go to here. There it is again. It's a line. This has to be true size and shape in this view. The definition of a normal plane is true size and shape in one view. It's an edge view in all adjacents. A normal plane. By adjacent, I mean views that sit right next to it. You can apply this to any drawing that you have. Doesn't matter if it's architectural, civil, whatever. You see that face? Look at an adjacent view where we're looking at it from 90 degrees. If it's a line, that thing's true size and shape where you're looking at it. Nice to know. It gives you the orient orient orientation. Also means you can scale it. Now, that's one of the planes you will see. It will be the majority of the planes you see. We have two other planes that sit out there, though, and let's look at those because you will come across them. Okay, the next one is shown on figure 520. Um, it's actually probably shown better on 521. Let's go to 520. Okay, the author here is again showing that same projection. The green shaped ones are normal planes. The blue ones are inclined. Let me just give you a definition of inclined right off the bat and then we'll explain how you find it. So inclined plane. It will be an edge in one view. I've got FS for foreshortened, or you could write smaller, okay? Either or. An inclined plane will always be an edge in one view. It will be foreshortened in all adjacent views. So see the difference in the definition between these two? Okay, this one, we're gonna find an edge in one view. Do you see it right here in this red shape? This one, this plane right here is a plane. So I see that. Now it just so happens I see that edge true length. Sometimes you will not. Then if I look to an adjacent view, I see a shape. 
Now this could still be normal or inclined, right? Based on those two definitions. But then when I go to the third view and I see another shape, I know this is inclined. Okay. Because there'd be another edge here if it was normal, right? That's an inclined plane. Now, what does that tell me on that? An inclined plane is never displayed in a glass box, true size and shape, ever. Okay. So it's one of those tricky ones. We're going to have to step outside our box later here in about two weeks. We're going to show how we describe and show these planes. But we will never see them in multi-views, true size and shape. Isn't that the whole purpose of doing multi-views, to get true size and shape? Yeah. So we have a problem here, right? We'll solve it. Don't worry. There's been some smart people ahead of us. They've solved all this stuff for us. Now we just need to learn their techniques. So that's an incline plane. The edge of one view foreshortened in all adjacent, where you do not see a true size and shape. The last plane is everybody's favorite, called an oblique. An oblique plane, shown right here in B. The oblique. And this one, definition is easy. Foreshortened in all views. Okay. You never see this plane true size and shape. You'll never see the edge. You'll never see true size and shape. And you can kind of see why as they set up the glass box. Remember, we always look perpendicular, right? I would have to be looking I don't even know if I can draw this angle. Somewhere right in like that. It would be tilted up, looking down, to see that. So, whenever you look at a plane, you never see the edge, you know you're looking oblique. All right, I think that's enough definitions for today. Keep in mind that the three planes we just defined are the only three planes you will ever see. That's all there is. Okay. We, can, we can 